Hello and welcome everybody. Um, as you're trickling in, I'll just um, mention a few housekeeping things for uh, today's webinar. Um, we're presenting this from the Center for Open Science uh, about the OSF infrastructure platform and particularly focusing on OSF for institutions, which is an administrative tool um, that sits on top of the OSF uh, generalist repository, uh, collaborative workspace and publishing platform. Um, uh, a couple of things, uh, I'm here with two of my colleagues from the Center for Open Science, um, including Gretchen Gigan, who um, is an expert on all things OSF institutions and um, runs all of our uh, member services um, and is very um, adept at answering any questions you might have, uh, big picture or in the weeds questions. So if you do have questions while I'm talking, drop them in the Q&A section um, of the Zoom webinar, and that way we can keep track of them and Gretchen can help answer. Um, we also have Teresa Vo from our marketing team here as well. So a lot of people from COS, <clears throat> excuse me, who can answer your questions. Um, I just wanna also say that if you have any questions at all about any of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about, um, the, the whole intention of this webinar is to give you um, an overview and a sense of what OSF for Institutions is and does, what you get for an annual membership fee, um, and what we have and what we're working on uh, to provide you in the future as well. So any questions about that, the whole point is that you reach out to me um, and I am happy to either answer those questions in a call and an email or connect you to people at the organization um, or on our engineering or product team who can uh, help you answer any of the questions you may have. So with that out of the way, um, feel free to also introduce yourselves if you'd like, um, just uh, your, your name, your position, maybe where you are, what institution you're at or organization um, in the chat, questions in the Q&A. And I'll start off by emphasizing my email, Gretchen's email. Please shoot us an email if you uh, do have questions. Um, and also, um, if it seems like um, you have a question that may be answered in the next half hour, um, you might want to wait. But feel free to free to drop those questions in there right now. Um, I also just wanna note that the intention uh, for this webinar is to speak to any kind of research support staff. Um, usually research support staff in libraries are interested in um, uh, the OSF for Institutions product, but um, you know it may be that you're working at another type of research organization um, uh, for which this product might be useful. Um, and I'll talk about uh, some of the um, requirements for utilizing OSF for institutions, um, uh, one of which to note at the top is um, we do utilize a single sign-on login for OSF institutions. Um, so if your support staff at an organization that doesn't have a single sign-on for um, for your researchers or, or your faculty or staff or um, anything like that, it might not be the best tool. However, we do have other tools for um, organization and uh, you know curation of research that may work for you. It might just not be OSF for institutions. So while I'm chatting, um, Teresa is just going to help launch a little Zoom survey that's going to help um, uh, me and Gretchen understand uh, where all of you are at in terms of your familiarity with the OSF. So feel free to just answer those questions. Are you familiar with the OSF? Have you ever made an OSF account? Um, and are you familiar with OSF institutions? There's no wrong answer. Our expectation is probably few of you are extremely familiar um, with the OSF or OSF institutions. If you haven't made an account, um, please make an account right now. You can do it while I'm talking. It'll take you just a couple of minutes. Um, if you go to osf.io, uh, create an account. Um, if it turns out your institution is already a member, that might be something that um, you find out when you uh, sign on or sign up. Um, but doing that can help you, you know, uh, play around while I'm talking or, um, you know, search for material on the OSF and, um, and have a look at some of the examples that, um, that I provide uh, in the slides. So I can see there's like a nice spread here. Majority of you are not familiar with OSF institutions, which is great. So 
Um, if you ever want to dive deeper into any of the infrastructure tools, OSF institutions, but also collections, registries, uh, preprints, um, you can find that all on our cos.io products page. So just to, to uh, orient us all um, to start, the OSF is always free for individual users. So um, we don't have caps um, on um, how many users you can have at your institution. Our pricing is not based on the number of users you have at your institution. And um, any individual person, including users at your institution, may already be on the platform now. Um, they can also join in the future. It's always free for them. Um, they can immediately link their ORCID ID um, as, a, as a user. Anybody can link their ORCID, uh, one's ORCID ID to their OSF account um, to make sure that material that they're um, publishing or making public on the OSF is also linked to that uh, persistent identifier. And there's three major workflows on the OSF. Um, I like to think of them as workflows. You could also think of them as objects on the OSF, um, uh, publishable objects. They could be private, so I can't find them on the OSF, but they could also be public so that everybody can find them. Um, and those three things are projects, OSF projects, which you'll hear me refer to, OSF registrations, um, and OSF preprints. Um, and uh, the OSF is a, a sort of generalist registry, so anybody can publish a registration on the OSF. Same goes for preprints, which I'm sure most of you on this call are very familiar with the um, the the, uh, the object of a preprint. Um, and we also operate as a kind of generalist preprint service. So anybody can publish a preprint. For those for registrations and preprints, we also offer essentially branded um, uh, services for communities who want to operate their own registry or their own preprint service. Um, and um, as I'm talking, if you have questions about that, I'm sure you know Gretchen can can drop a couple links to show what those look like, those branded services, um, but just want to flag that in case that's a point of confusion. So there's a kind of generalist way of working with these within these workflows, but then we also um, support communities that want to have their own moderated uh, registries or uh, preprint services. Um, and these three primary objects on the OSF are what uh, we are going to be focusing on in terms of content as it pertains to affiliation with an institution as part of OSF institutions. So what are projects? Um, projects are kind of what differentiate the OSF from uh, maybe a number of other uh, competitors or other um, repositories, which you might be more familiar with. Um, projects are what I like to think of as a um, collaborative sandbox. They're also um, the, the kind of central node or point um, at which you can link to a lot of other material um, that might not necessarily fall into the category of uh, you know, preprint or registration. Um, you can um, upload files, you can version files, you can, there's an activity log that tracks changes. You can add and uh, rearrange a lot of different components of a project so that it looks um, uh, different from a, a different type of project that another user might be um, publishing on the platform. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, privacy settings that can be modified, not just on the project itself, but on components within a project. And the whole point of making a project um, and as flexible as it is um, uh, on the OSF is that we wanted to make the utilization of the OSF as simple as possible for collaborators who are maybe working at different institutions or have different uh, affiliations um, so that they could have one place where they they link to integrate and, and uh, create all of the additional um, or put all of the additional material that might help understand um, uh, a research project or any other kind of um, experiment or paper or, you know, their own lab group um, uh, and have that in one place. So it really allows for uh, a, a really vast array of different um, engagements with the OSF platform in this one space, this project space. You can plan things, you can collaborate, you can organize, you can um, make, keep the entire thing private and just use it as a, as your own lab notebook um, or as a collaborative lab notebook with others. Um, once a project is made public, um, you can also mint a DOI for that project. 
Um, and a couple of the really powerful features that you can utilize when you're creating a project or when um, people at your institution are, are utilizing a project um, is that you can collaborate with anyone. Um, there's no limitation. So even if your institution becomes an OSF um, institutional member, um, the affiliation of your institution would be on public projects that your users made. Um, they can also remove that. But they can also collaborate with other institutions, whether or not they're member institutions. Um, as I mentioned, you can set really fine-grained permissions. So if a, a you know a collaborative uh, group wants to make just part of their research public, but other parts private and only accessible to collaborators, they can do that. If they want to keep the project as an archive and just have um, very minimal uh, research outcomes shared, but nothing else shared, they can do that. We have a really robust metadata schema on the OSF um, and persistent identifiers of all kinds in the project space, um, including for OSF institutional members, the ROAR affiliation. Um, and we also, uh, 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 I'll talk about this in a little bit. We we have, um, uh, we utilize Crossref, um, data site, ORCID IDs. You can also mint DOIs for your public projects and uh, sync all of your OSF content with your ORCID record. We're a nonprofit. Um, we have a, a API. Uh, we're open source. Um, so if you do have um, specific needs, specific integrations that don't exist, um, you need engineering help. Um, we have uh, ways and means to to work with you. But we're all, we're also working on uh, documentation, um, more extensive documentation of our API, so that um, so that your team might be able to utilize that. Um, so registrations on the OSF. Um, registrations may or may not be um, as familiar to you. Um, clinicaltrials.gov is kind of one of the most um, recognizable uh, uh, domain-specific registries. Registrations can be, I think the easiest, simplest way to think of them is they're time-stamped archived objects on the OSF or any other registry that might exist. Um, they cannot be deleted. Um, so they're a sort of a permanent entry on the OSF. And if you think about the research lifecycle being supported by the OSF for your researchers, projects are kind of the sandbox space. They're really flexible and messy. They can be used you know, in lots of different types of ways. Regis a registration, um, which can be created in two ways on the OSF. So you can make a registration from scratch or you can fork a project. Um, in and bring all of the data, metadata files into a registration. Um, registrations are kind of the next step in the lifecycle um, support that the OSF provides to researchers. And um, the OSF, in terms of its support for the research lifecycle, is again sort of differentiated from some of the other um, generalist repositories in, in the ecosystem. Um, uh, because it can support uh, the publication of a registration, uh, a few uh, types of updates to registrations, um, as well as the um, connection between a registration um, and um, affiliated projects. Okay, so getting to OSF institutions. So what is an OSF institutional membership? Um, I'll show you a couple of examples um, of this, but you can see here um, on my slides, uh, Case Western University's uh, OSF institutional page, as well as their um, institutional libguide for the OSF. What OSF institutions does is utilizes single sign-on authentication to allow for all of the projects, registrations, and preprints that are affiliated with um, users at your institution to be automatically aggregated under an institutional page. So that's what you can see here um, uh, for Case Western's page. It also adds the ROAR institutional identifier to metadata uh, associated with those projects, registrations, and preprints. And then that gets shared downstream in places like Datacite and ORCID. So it makes it easier for you to aggregate and have uh, visibility into all of the uh, public material uh, that users are publishing on the platform and to find it elsewhere. So not only do those projects and registrations and preprints appear on the landing page for an OSF institutional uh, uh, account, but uh, sorry, for membership, but the institutional branding um, also appears on affiliated projects and registrations. So I'll show you that really quickly here. This is an example of um, University of British Columbia's um, institutional page. Um, you can see, you can search by users. There's also files, uh, preprints, registrations, and projects. 
just to note what you're looking at here is the institutional page for UBC as it would be viewed by anybody. As a institutional member, you would have a special administrative dashboard um, uh, so that you could have some insight into what all of your users are doing at a much um, finer degree of de with a finer degree of detail. Um, and within uh, this UBC page, all of this material has been auto aggregated from from uh, uh, UBC users on the OSF. So anytime a public registration is um, uh, published on the OSF, it will be automatically aggregated onto this UBC page. And you can see, um, this is actually UBC's uh, OSF LibGuide. So this is where they describe how to use OSF institutions for their users and, and describe, you know, they describe it as a collaboration and research management tool. Other institutions may utilize their OSF institutions account for other reasons as a replacement for an institutional repository, for example, or in a parallel workflow to a repository. Um, this is an example of a project that a UBC um, a researcher has published on the platform and because it's affiliated with UBC, you have the UBC um, affiliated branding on the page as well as obviously the ROAR identifier as part of the metadata of this project. Um, and you can see here's an example of what a registration looks like on the OSF. This one is also published by a UBC researcher. You can see there's actually an affiliated project with this registration. Um, on the right hand side here, there's a, uh, the um, the link to that project. Um, there's also a DOI for this, and there's the affiliation with UBC, and this is the um, verified affiliation via our OSF institutions membership. And um, this registration um, is also uh, in data site commons, and you can see um, here's the, the registration. Um, it's published in Open Science Framework that you have the DOI here, um, and this is all contributing to and can be found through UBC's um, uh, page on data site as well. So it's it's all um, uh, findable on all of these um, external um, platforms as well. So um, I'm just noting, I'm not looking at the chat right now. So um, yeah, I can see Gretchen has got all of those uh, questions there. So, um, one of the things that uh, we often get questions about is, uh, you know, how does single sign on work? How do I make sure that, um, you know, everybody at my institution knows that we have this um, uh, this membership? Um, Gretchen Gigan, who's here on the call, is one of the people that you'll be speaking with extensively if you sign up um, to make sure that all of the extensive resources that we have, that other institutions have provided um, as examples, that you get access to that and, and helps you um, set up single sign-on as well as all of the other administrative settings um, that you need to, to set up. Um, there's no limit to the number of administrators. So if you have um, folks from libraries, but also from research or departments who need to have administrative access to OSF institutions, we can also set that, set that up as well. Um, and it doesn't end there. We have a number of um, town halls that, that Gretchen runs as part of our OSF institutional membership. So you can um, gain an insight um, and hear from other OSF institutional members about how they're using um, their membership. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities as well to speak to other members of our team, our research team, uh, for example, or our policy team to understand how to, to best utilize the institutional membership. So that's all a part of uh, what we provide um, with the membership. Um, one thing to note is that um, regardless of whether or not you become a member, uh, we built the OSF to be interoperable with existing tools that uh, researchers already use, uh, and specifically storage tools and citation tools. The idea is that uh, especially an OSF project becomes a place where you can link to um, existing uh, storage infrastructure that uh, you already have as a user. Um, so as an institutional member, if your users um, are using your institutional storage, um, they can simply link to that on an OSF project instead of storing material directly on the OSF, although that is also uh, a possibility. Where this becomes really powerful is in uh, collaborative project work workspaces where let's say I work at one institution and Gretchen works at another. We utilize different storage uh, tools. We can um, organize our storage, link it together in one project and have all of the affiliated metadata um, 
uh, findable within that project about those files and, and that stored data. So the idea here is try to reduce redundancy um, and try to increase the, the findability and fairness of the, the research and metadata as it's published on the platform. So this is just a, an example of um, what this looks like. Um, so <clears throat> as an example here, this is a project space. These are some of the settings in the project space. Um, this is a configuration of some add-on integrations with Box, GitHub, Google Drive, and Zotero. So that means that in this project space, um, I could pull in files and references um, across these other tools into the project with other materials that I place there. Um, and OSF at the moment can integrate um, about uh, 13 storage providers and citation managers. And we're actually working on a really big um, add-ons integration project now to, to kind of expand um, the possibility of different integrated services and, and make that integration easier. Um, there's also a number of products that have built their own OSF extensions to work in the other direction. So it, it will store and update OSF content from another application. We have a lot in our help guides um, around, around integrations. And um, if you do have any questions about that, um, ask them now, or you can feel free to reach out to myself uh, or Gretchen. Um, I, these are links I'll, uh, actually, Teresa will be sending out um, uh, an email after this um, webinar with these slides so you can uh, click through. These are just the, the University of British Columbia pages that I showed you before. Um, and a couple really big things that are happening. So take note, um, we have a, a big uh, dashboard upgrade coming down the line. So this is happening in the next couple of months. Um, definitely by the end of the year. We aim to make this um, available to all of our OSF institutional members, um, uh, existing and new, um, by 2025. Um, at the moment, the metrics that you get as an administrator um, are only available at a, a, a specific level, um, and uh, Gretchen can share our COS um, product pricing page um, in, in the uh, chat so you can have a look at that. There's a $2,500 membership level and a $5,000 membership level. At the $2,500 level, um, you get uh, quarterly reports. Gretchen can sit down with you and, and chat with you. These are um, a kind of a look at projects and registrations and preprints, views, downloads, you know, users, private versus public material and files. Um, but it's a static quarterly report. At the $5,000 level, you have an administrative metrics dashboard, which is, um, uh, you can see here, um, We and you also get those quarterly reports. But what we're doing is we're massively upgrading that to give you much more insight and control over um, uh, visibility of that data and, and information. Um, if you're really interested in that, I can send you um, a preview of what that dashboard will look like. And again, that will be available starting the beginning of next year. Um, so if you are interested, um, uh, now is the time to think about whether or not um, you, you know, would like to come in at least for the first year at this $2,500 level um, or at the $5,000 level. Um, after the end of this year, the $2,500 level will not be available anymore because we really want to give everybody access to this advanced metrics dashboard. So I'm just flagging this for you. Um, those of you who are here in the webinar or who are listening to the webinar uh, recording, that there is some sort of urgency if budgetary constraints are um, an issue for you in terms of our current pricing schema. But also just to flag that we um, we do not have, again, constraints on the number of users, um, the number of projects or registrations or preprints published as part of our institutional membership. There are no limits there. We do have storage caps on individual projects, but not on the number of projects. So essentially there is um, there's not really a cap at all um, on uh, material and none of that is related to pricing. So just wanna flag that. Um, I'll also be sending through to you some examples of existing OSF institutional members that have actually put a lot of their resources um, online uh, on the OSF. So um, here's an example, oh, this is actually from us, but here's an example of um, Carnegie Mellon's uh, LibGuide. Um, they also have a lot of OSF projects um, linked to there. Uh, here's an example of um, 
VU, which is a institution in Amsterdam and their OSF documentation, which they've actually chosen to put on the OSF itself. Um, so lots of different examples of kind of support resources and examples, which are the kind of material that Gretchen would uh, work with you to um, to collate and, and provide to your uh, researchers. We also have some really great um, series that we run both as webinars and also as part of uh, member services and town halls that Gretchen runs. This is an example of a, a case study webinar that we ran with one of our institutional members. It's kind of their best practices and what we've observed in working with them um, to encourage the use of the OSF platform. So they took advantage in the early years of their membership of some of our training resources. So we do also offer training. Um, it's modularized. We can we offer it virtually. Um, we also offer some of that material um, uh, for free for for our member institutions and users. So they they did that. They worked with us in, in the early years and then they took over and started running their own OSF workshops and also um, uh, started to run a data science lab, which teaches actually two oversubscribed data science courses that utilize the OSF um, for their grad students. And they found that this has been a really powerful way of encouraging the use of the OSF um, from early in the research life cycle for individual researchers um, when they begin and start uh, doing research as graduate students. So this is just a really interesting case study. And this is one example of the kind of information that, that we can help um, give you to, to bolster both the case for using the OSF at your institution or becoming members, but also um, as you encourage your research community to use the platform. So a couple of quick things about our membership. All of the users who are coming from your institution and asking us for help about how to use the platform get prioritized with our help desk. We also can act as a, um, as a, uh, a third party to make sure that questions they have that really should be answered by your research support staff or by you or by other or by your library actually get routed um, to the correct people instead of us answering those questions. You'll have a dedicated um, uh, person on our product team, which is Gretchen. Uh, again, training and onboarding materials. There's actually a significant discount for virtual training for OSF institutional members. So just flagging that that's um, a big part of uh, one or one of the big benefits of OSF institutional membership. Um, you also, uh, again, have the simple institutional dashboard at the $5,000 level, um, and this is going to be updated significantly by year end. Um, the idea is also that um, we're building out our dashboard and our capacity for more of a data curation administrative role um, uh, in uh, 2025. So that is something that we've heard a lot of feedback about and, and we're building into our uh, feature roadmap. Um, and actually, Gretchen, I believe our feature roadmap has just been updated. So I, I don't know if you want to drop that link um, as well. Um, and um, everybody... Uh, at the moment, at the $2,500 level um, and above gets quarterly metrics reports. Um, that will be kind of discontinued at the end of this year as we move everybody up to the new um, advanced uh, metrics dashboard uh, level. So this is the next couple of months are really the only opportunity to opt in um, at this $2,500 level if you'd like to for the, for the first year. And um, one of the primary uh, points of confusion sometimes around the OSF is the sort of differentiation between what a user gets and what an administrative um, membership gets. All users on the OSF are individuals, so we don't have um, an account that is like an institutional account. What we do for institutional membership is that individual users who may be administrators or just users, uh, OSF users, um, have access to um, the dashboard, administrative settings, et cetera. But any person, um, whether or not you your institution is a member, any person at your institution can sign up for an OSF account today. Um, what you get with membership is uh, that uh, ROAR affiliation, um, the, the auto-aggregated single sign-on um, of all public material, um, and the uh, institutional branding on um, projects and registrations, um, and very soon on preprints as well. Those preprints, though, are still auto-aggregated, um, affiliated on the back end um, with your ROAR identifier. You also get, uh, obviously, the branded landing page for your OSF institutional page, help desk prioritization, 
um, and uh, discounts on trading, um, as well as those usage reports that I mentioned. Um, I talked a bit about pricing. If you do have questions about that, as as we are about to um, um, uh, remove the twenty five hundred dollar level by the end of the year, please reach out to me. Happy to to um, set up a call, answer any questions you may have. Um, talk also about training that we can offer. Um, you don't need to be an OSF institutional member to have training. So we do offer a la carte training services um, as well as uh, additional storage um, and custom domains, things like that. So uh, please reach out if you do have any questions. I'll just leave this up for a moment while I look in the chat, see if there's any questions. Okay. I think that's it. If you do um, uh, want to reach out, again, feel free to shoot me an email. You'll also be getting a follow-up email with the link to this recording and the slides. Um, and I really appreciate you all coming. One other thing I want to flag um, is that if you're interested in knowing how many existing users you have at your institution, um, I can tell you that public information and, and uh, collate and aggregate it for you. So happy to do that um, and just shoot me an email. Well, thanks again.